most excellent. Thank you very much. And we are in great hands with Maria Gary on the other end of the call, that's for sure. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. What a great group we have today. We've got a, a lot of interest in this topic, <laughs> and we see that quite a lot. Um, Education is vital for all of our relationships. We understand that for for building relationships, for maintaining our relationships, and those are our relationships at work and at home as well. So all the topics, all of the points and the tips that I'm going to share with you today, you can use this in any relationship, whether they be work-related or personal or just interacting with with the folks in the grocery store. I mean, these are really good um, good tips that we have to share with you today, real great practical advice. And that's, obviously that, that's what we do really well here at, at Work Life For You is we get practical solutions to the problems that, gosh, you know we all face from time to time. We're going to talk a little bit about our program at the end. We'll put up a slide that um, gives you a little bit more information about who we are and what we do. But really what it all boils down to is, um, you know, we really are here for you. We can help you resolve just about anything you face in your life, any issue that you face in your life, from uh, pet care to elder care, health issues, uh, work-related issues, you name it. We've got some folks there that can help you find resolution to that. Let's go ahead and, and jump right into um, temptation. You know, uh, so many of you, uh, you, you work with other people in your family relationships. We just have to have that, that strong communication in order to be successful. And sometimes we're just overwhelmed by an inability to communicate with people for so many different reasons. So today we're really going to provide for you an introduction to some really terrific communication uh, tools and skills you can use to enhance all of your relationships. And talk. we're going to talk a lot about conflict resolution too. So we really have to, we're going to define the importance of effective communication and talk about why why is it so hard? What are some of the barriers that are common among, across the board, among so many different people at different levels within an organization, within families, uh, within all of our interactions too. And there are some really uh, clear steps that you can take to improve your own communication skills. And we're going to talk a lot about those. The number one thing you really need to work on, folks, is not get a message across, it's receiving, right? So we really all can work on our communication skills and our listening skills. So we'll share a lot of information about that. Certainly conflict resolution is very, very important for us all. There are relationships without conflict. It simply is a part of being a human being. And oftentimes we find a really positive outcome conflict. So it's not all bad. So how can we manage it in a way that we can achieve those uh, those positive outcomes more frequently? And we'll talk about that. And at the end, we've got a little bit of information on assertive communication. Um, it's really a, a, a wonderful, wonderful way to communicate with other people, and, and it, it typically generates positive outcomes as well. So lots of stuff to share with you today. Um, so it's and for those of you that have read any of Stephen Covey's work, I particularly really love his his book, An Oldie But a Now, um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you haven't read that book, I would really, really recommend that uh, for your personal life and your business life as well, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. But this is one of his primary, uh, one of the primary things that he focuses on in the book is really to seek first to understand and then to worry about being understood because so frequently that's where the miscommunication comes into play is that, you know, we're just, um, it, we're not creating and maintaining those relationships because we're not listening to what the other person is saying. So we're going to give you some tools and skills that you can put together to really help you get your point across but to also be able to hear what other people have to say. So what are some of the barriers? What are some of the communication barriers that you've had? And, and this is something, the, as, as you're going along in today's presentation, maybe you can just keep some notes, um, some personal reflection, and, uh, you know, really think about what, what are some of the reasons why your communication with other people hasn't been as effective as you wish or hope it would be. So for yourself as we go along and, and really try to identify some of the barriers that, that you have had. And as I said, uh, there, you know, there's commonalities that, that we all experience, and lack of listening skills 
we just simply haven't learned to listen well. So that's, that's the first and foremost. But also language barriers, and certainly in today's diverse world in which we work, culturally diverse, I mean, we have people in our organizations from all over the world, which is fantastic, and it brings so much creativity and, and different backgrounds to the table. It's wonderful to have that kind of an environment, but in and of itself can create communication issues, but even more so than that, can just be um, something you know ob as obvious as people who, who don't have the same language or who haven't grown up with the same language, but also something more subtle such as interpreting words in a different way. Or you know some folks just don't use language really well. They're not um, very effective communicators, so poor grammar, poor spelling, and written communication as an example. Maybe just a lack of understanding of the context. Maybe, for instance, a, a non-technical person trying to communicate a very technical issue with someone, or vice versa, right? We've all been there with the IT person trying to explain something to us, and whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Can you use language I understand, right? Um, you know, and just the, the colloquialisms and the jargon that we have, and, you know, we all just bring different things to the table, and that is what we mean by language barriers. So there's a great potential for misunderstanding when our emotions are involved. And I oh so no, no. <laughs> We've all been there. When you love somebody, the emotions are going to be heightened. And when you're working on a project, um, that you've put your heart and soul into it, well, your emotions are going to be involved as well. So that can create a barrier. When a sender is upset or really angry, it's very difficult to communicate the feelings and ideas effectively when the emotion is the, is the filter through which it's going, right? And a receiver in the similar way, when a, the receiver is very emotionally upset, it's very easy to ignore what's being said or or to distort what's being said. We have environmental barriers, and these are just interruptions. You all work in very busy environments, I'm sure. Sometimes things, the distractions can be overwhelming, and that can interfere with communication. Lighting, the noise, the are you comfortable, are you not comfortable? I have a friend who I love dearly, but my goodness, she almost whispers when she speaks. And so I just get tired of asking her to repeat herself sometimes, and so I miss things, right? That can be a, a barrier, of an environmental barrier, if you will. Oftentimes we have so many folks that are ro working remotely, and gosh, there's such a big part of our communication that's nonverbal, and we lose so much of that uh, via webinars such as this, right? And also just working with, let's say you're in a conference room and you've got a few people calling in, there's an issue there with that. Um, timing. Some, we, I don't know about you, but boy, my days are, boom, tightly structured. I don't always have the time I wish I did to really listen and communicate clearly. Maybe it's too early in the day. Maybe the time that you're picking to communicate with someone is too late in the day, and you know they're just unable to focus. Um, we each have our personal experiences that we bring to the table, uh, and, and that's unique to each of us. Right, so we're going to send our messages out based on our own personal reality, and we're responsible for that, right? But you know, we all receive that in a different way. We all receive that communication in a different way. Age, education, gender, our social status, our economic position, cultural background, our temperament, just our personalities, right? Our popularity, our religion, our political beliefs. These are all variables can alter our perceptions and can create barriers to our communication, both our ability to send and receive, and filtering too, right? Think about the classic children's game of telephone where a message is passed from one person to another, right? So finally, when the message gets around the circle, it's usually completely different than the way it started, and that actually happens. We've, we've all had stories where, um, you know, we've seen that happen. Maybe, um, you know, it's a, maybe an assistant or someone leaves a message it just or, or someone takes a message for you. I don't know, those of you with teenage kids, you're lucky if they've been around the message, let alone get it right, right? <laughs> but sometimes it's just lost in, uh, in the process of getting it out there. And now, listening. So is so important. That's why I'm going to talk about it quite a bit. But let me ask you to really start thinking about, maybe take some notes as we go through this, 
about what are your own strategies to become a better listener. And my of the points that we're going to make now today, what might be some of these things that you can implement into your operating procedures if you were a person and, and how you might become a better receiver of information from other people? Because active listening really is the, the foundation for good communication. Okay, and these are the things that help you to become a better listener. So first of all, you need to really focus on what the other person is saying. Um, and and, and you, a part of this is freeing yourself from the preconceived ideas of what you think they are saying or write this down what you think they should be saying. So often we are assuming where someone is going and we stop listening. Give the other person your full attention and really listen to what they're saying and without interrupting. Um, and this is an opportunity to learn something about the other person, right? I'm not saying you have to agree with what they're saying. I'm just saying really hear what they're saying. You might be surprised. Um, use your body language. Think about your own body language. Um, keep, you want to keep good eye contact. Stay focused. Lean forward. Keep your body language open. Are your arms crossed? Are your shoulders curled around? Are you really closed off, literally, to this person? Um, you know, be a little more and have your body language a little, little softer, encouraging gestures. Try not to fidget or seem impatient or be looking around. And by coming responses, what we mean is just the simple little things like, okay, all right, I'm understanding. I think I'm understanding. It encourages the other person to continue speaking. and also shows that you're listening. Certainly you don't. I, I, I have known people who you to talk to them and they're constantly, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You kind of feel like you're being pushed along to hurry up. So you, know, you want to monitor that. You don't want to use too many of those. Now here's the key. Write this down. Restate what you believe the other person has said. And it's going to do a couple of things. First of all, it's going to indicate to them that you've been listening. And it will also get uh, you – it will let them know what you understood, right, what message that you understood, and it gives them the opportunity to clarify anything. Because quite honestly, sometimes no matter how hard we try, what we hear isn't as accurate as what is actually being expressed. We're not processing it the same way that they think they are sending it, okay? So when you restate and you ask questions, you know, look at an opportune time to clarify, to ask anything that is unclear, then that gives them the opportunity to, to clarify uh, what their point is. Try to listen beyond what's actually being said. It, it, um, some uh, psychologists and people who really specialize in communication refer to it as a third ear, if you will. So you want to pay attention to nonverbal messages. What are the emotions? What are the attitudes, the tone of voice, the body language? You know, so try to listen beyond what the words actually are. And then when everything is all done, before you move on to your part, you summarize um, what the person has said. And, then, and again, that is an opportunity for clarification. In addition to that, you want to uh, let the other person know that you value what they're saying. You value what their point was. You don't have to agree with it. That doesn't mean you agree with it. You're validating their position without agreeing necessarily, right? So try to avoid responding negatively uh, or directively. So, for example, you, don't, you certainly don't want to criticize or ridicule or dismiss or divert from what they've been saying by talking about something in your own life. You're using it to illustrate their point, right? But, um, and you certainly don't want to reject the other person or what they are saying. Uh, and then respond appropriately. So you've made sure that you clearly understand what they want from you. You're responding appropriately. Um, if you're not certain what the other per person is looking for, ask them. They just want to express their feelings about something. Maybe they are looking for some advice or direction, but ask them what it is that they're looking for from you. Because oftentimes the messages that we receive uh, Again, they're not exactly what the other person wanted to convey. And I have a great story that illustrates that. I was at a large corporation several years ago doing a session on assertive communication. And it was for one of their women's, uh, women's groups. So the room was full of, uh, I think we had a full room. The capacity was about 35 people. And people 
people from administrative assistants all the way up through the CFO was in the room as well. And um, at some point in, in their recent history, there had been some changes to their compensation package. And one of the administrative assistants during the presentation, I'd already picked up on the fact that um, her communication style was very confrontational, <laughs> putting it nicely. She actually made very, all the people around her uncomfortable, I could tell. She was quite an aggressive person in her communication style. And at some point she just decided that since she was in the room with the CFO, this would be a good opportunity to have a conversation about these recent changes to their compensation pa package. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> so I the conversation under control, got back on track with, with the presentation. And after the presentation was over, this woman approached me. And I tried to make myself available, you know, for questions and things like that. Which, by the way, we'll do at the end. I'll, I'll leave some, some time at the end for your uh, questions. This woman approached me, and she says, I want to talk to you. And I thought, uh-oh, I was a little nervous. Um, and I said, okay. And she well, I, I just had something happen recently, and, and, and I was looking for some advice. And I said, okay. She said, just had my, my performance review. And, and they told me that I was aggressive and that I was difficult to work with and that, uh, that you know, people didn't like working with me. I said, okay. So what you're asking me then to tell you is, you know, what you're looking for from me is maybe some assertive ways to respond to the feedback. And she said, no, I don't understand why they think that. I'll tell you what, as a professional speaker, it's rare that I am speechless. <laughs> but at that moment, I truly was. And I, I'm so thankful that I understood that I needed to ask those questions for clarification before I just started giving her feedback, because all I would have done would have been to continue to irritate her. She didn't understand. She had no idea how her behavior was viewed by other people. So then I worked with her and talked with her on some ways to try to do some some self understanding and talk to some other people. And you know, we worked on that. But what a what a perfect example of what we're talking about and why it is so important to listen and to ask for clarification and to restate what the other person is saying. So if you write nothing else down, just write that down. Listen. Ask questions for clarification and restate what you heard, what you think you've heard, because as that illustrates, it's not always not always what we think. Okay, so so let me ask you now, think about this. What are your strategies for communicating in a way that will be heard? And where do you find some of the things that you've just identified? Might you be able to make some uh, tweak things a little bit and maybe become a little bit more effective about, about speaking and communicating very, very clearly. Um, and we've got some great tips here. So the first thing you do, it's kind of a funny way to phrase it, get on the radar, but honestly, we don't, when we're coaching someone, especially in a conflict resolution position or when we're even just trying to, to get ideas and our thoughts out there, we're about ourselves and our perspective, what we really need to do is stop, first of all, is this the best time to talk to this person about this issue? And because if they're not going to be able to pay attention to us, then we're not going to get the information we need. For example, one of, I have a 16-year-old son. He, he came up to me yesterday at a, an event that I was organizing for the school and was asking me questions about something that was going to be going on that night. And, you know, I, I had to say to him, honey, I can't, I can't really even think about that right now. Let's talk about this in about a half an hour or so. It was, the timing was not good. But he was coming from a 16-year-old's perspective. He was looking for the answer and wasn't thinking about what I might have been in, in the middle of. So that's the first thing you want to do. Make sure you have eye contact. Use the person's name. Make sure you have their attention and that this is, in fact, the best time to talk to them before you just move right in because it might not be. Um, and that might, not be, that might be why the communication doesn't go that well because they don't want to be rude and shush you away, but maybe it's not the best time for them. Use your I phrases. And this is, this is really a key component to assertive communication. Instead of, let's say, for instance, you're working with a colleague and your work depends upon them uh, completing their part of the project and sending it over to you and 
they consistently miss their deadline, which of course impacts your work. Okay, let's say that's the scenario. Um, to go to the coworker or to the colleague and say, you know, you really should get those numbers to me on time because you're really kind of screwing up what I need to do here. And, you know, my job is getting all out of whack because I'm not getting what I need from, from you. Well, all of those things might very well be true, but you're setting yourself up for a conflict. You're not setting yourself up for the, the, the potential to resolve that issue. So when you use I statements and you let the other person know how you are affected by their behaviors or choices, that turns things around. When you're saying you, 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 folks just stick your finger out and wag it in their face because that's what you're doing effectively and that's what they're going to feel immediately defensive. So instead approach the other person with Paula, listen, I want to talk to you about something. Is this a good time? Okay, good. Because I, 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 I've noticed that the numbers, when you, when you finish your numbers, I'm not getting them until after the deadline. So I'm having a really hard time keeping up with my end of this project. And in turn, I'm, I'm really having a hard time meeting my deadline and sending my, my part of the project on along down the line. So I was wondering if we could work together to try to improve that timing a little bit. And is there something I could do to, you know, to help you achieve that? Or, you know, what could we do to find a resolution to that? Right? You're not telling the other person you're wrong, you're behind, you know. You're, you're really just looking for a resolution. And that frees people up to be able to respond in a positive way. So it's a really powerful tool. And, by the way, it works brilliantly with teenagers and husbands. <laughs> Spouses, I'm sure, and significant others, and actually, uh, as far as that goes, all all conversations. Um, okay, so and speaking of conversations, you want to have open-ended conversations. So avoid um, questions that will end up in the one-word answer. You want to use and pick your questions um, thoughtfully, and as you practice these things, they'll all come to you more naturally over time. But you, you want instead of saying um, the simple yes or looking for yes or no answer, tell me about. Out. You know, tell me about why it is that you're ha having a difficult time getting these numbers to me by the deadline. Maybe there's more going on that you can really help them find a resolution to. Or what about the new project that just came along, you know, that just came along here. And in your personal world, this is a trick that I use frequently at the dinner table with a big family. Tell me a story about your day. Now, there's not a person in the world that can deny you that. Tell me a story about your day. And it kind of gets people talking and, uh, you know, just gets the conversation going. But it's not, it's not closed-ended. It's open-ended conversation that you're looking for. You certainly want to be open and honest about your own feelings. You want to share them truthfully but respectfully. So approach the discussions that you're having as an opportunity for the other person to learn something about you. Right? And sometimes we need to expose a vulnerability here and there a little bit. Um, and that's not always a bad thing. That might be a really good thing, and that might be the icebreaker, if you will, that encourages better communication. Be very specific about the issue at hand and how it makes you feel. So you want to avoid the generalizations, um, the statements like always and never and, and ever. And you always do this. Well, there, you've turned – you've turn to switch right there. You've created a negative environment immediately. You never meet your deadlines on time. Click off because the person knows that that's not true. Um, so stay away from that. Stick to the subject and try not to digress into personality issues and try not to revive past issues. Now, if you're thinking in the, in the terms of a personal relationship, I do understand how that happens, especially if you're in a long-term relationship or a family relationship uh, where you're, you know, you have these family members for your whole life. Love, like them or not, they're, they're your family members for your whole life, right? So um, if those past issues come up, a great technique to deal with that is to say, okay, there's, there's some residual issues from this incident that happened four years ago. And I, you know what? I think you're right. We do need to solve those. I'm going to write this down. And we're going to come up with a time in the future, tomorrow, next week, whatever, where we can address this. But right now, I really want to stay focused on this topic at hand. I really want to try to find resolution to this. I promise 
to you that is important to me, and we will come back to that. And oh, it's hard to do. I really do. I understand that, especially when your emotions are clouding all of that. But if you practice that and try that, it's remarkable the result that you get from that. And then the follow-up conversation that you must have is usually extremely productive. So it's really powerful, very powerful thing to do. Be very try to be as positive as you can. Focus on the other person's positive points. You want to be in general outside of having any kind of conflict resolution or trying to effectively communicate. Part of that is indirect in being specific and generous and public with your praise. Make sure that you're giving positive feedback and that that positive feed what feedback outweighs your criticism. And then people will be able to hear you. If all someone hears from you is criticism, even if it's periodic, they're not going to like, they're not even going to want to see you walking down the hall, let alone listen to what you have to say. So it's very important to make sure that not only is that balanced, but that's actually out of balance. In this case, you definitely want to be out of balance. You want your positive to far outweigh the negative. Um, try to be very responsive without being reactive. And that's a learned ability. Okay, so be respectful and calm and positive. <sighs> a nice deep breath can help with that. If the, es if the discussion is really beginning to escalate into anger, it's okay to take a short break. You know, it sounds like, I or even turn it on yourself. You know what, honestly, I'm getting pretty upset right now, and I really don't want this to turn into a fight or an argument. I actually want this to turn into something where we can find some resolution to this problem, and I don't think that's where we're headed. So I'm going to step away. I'm going to take a five-minute break, a ten-minute break. I'll meet you tomorrow. We'll talk again next week. Whatever works, and do that. Step away. And, and, and come back. honestly, folks, even a one-minute break, take a drink of water, step outside, take a few deep breaths, oftentimes that's all that's needed to Break that cycle of frustration and kind of get people um, get people back on back on track. Um, so uh, you know, so that's that's a good thing that you can do too. Responding and not reacting. Ask another person during the conversation for a summary. Find a, a you know, it's like a polite way to make sure that you've been understood. Not everybody's listening to this presentation today. They don't know they need to restate for clarification, right? So something as simple as, you know, asking the person, could you just summarize what we've discussed? I just want to be sure that, that I've communicated clearly because I want to be sure we're on the right page because I really feel like we're going to find some resolution to this. Or at work, could you review the major deliverables um, to make sure that I'm going in the right direction? It's a very useful technique with your children. As well, because if you make them restate to you the instructions or the conversation, then they can't deny hearing you in the future. They might, but you can remember that they said that they heard what you said. And and the other two folks, the last point on here is so important. The other, the goal is to resolve a conflict, not to win. Because if you have a winner. You all have a loser, and that's productive. And the long-term payoff of that is a continued negative adversarial relationship. We're not looking to make losers and winners. We're looking to resolve our conflict, right? It's so powerful, so powerful for us to understand. Now, writing can be very frustrating. Just recently, I received a series of emails from someone, and they honestly sounded a bit curt and just this side of rude. Then when I spoke with the person face-to-face -face about it, I didn't bring it up because it really wasn't a huge issue, but I understood that this person was just just overload and just replying, trying to keep their head above water by replying as quickly as she could to these emails to get them off of her to-do list, right? So. So and, and written communication can be a little tricky to make sure that we're communicating effectively, and that's why it's so, so important for us to, uh, you know, to make sure that we are, in fact, doing that. I believe, um, Maria, there's some handouts that are going to be a part of the – you'll be receiving the PowerPoint slides as well as the handouts, Maria. They'll be uh, receiving that in their information. 
that's correct, Donna. Hey, excellent. So one of those is a sheet. There's two pages, actually, um, of com effective communication tips. goes into a little more detail, kind of uh, summarizes some of the things that we talked about today. But the, a writing effectively tip sheet that you can keep, a little cheat sheet in your drawer, if you will, um, that will help you a little bit, too. So that's, you know, that's just one of the things that we have for you. But first of all, you really want to plan what it is that you're writing. And if it's something more than a quick email, you go by school, folks. Use outline. It is a powerful tool, and it also helps you to organize your thoughts. It, it, and it can be as messy as you want. Nobody's going to see it but you. But you write an outline of the structure of what you want to say, right? Based on the, the three or four parts of a typical communication, a letter or a report or something, you know, the opening, the instruction, you're getting the reader's attention, you're putting in the reason why you're writing, the main body of the message is the details that you're trying to convey, and then you, you want the, what, are, what are the results that you're looking for? So you're stating the information or the action that you're seeking, and then you close. You summarize the major ideas, um, and, and that's, that's a, a classic form of written communication. When you use that as a structure for your outline, then your messages almost write themselves from that point, and your thoughts are very clear and concise, and your your communication will be much clearer and concise. And I appreciate that. Who wants it? Can I tell you this? I'm going to tell you this. If you send me an email and you send me six long paragraphs, oh my goodness, chances are I'm probably going to skim through it for the basic information, and that is what most people do. Honestly, it's the 80-20 rule. People, about 20% of what's contained in that, effect, in that communication is relevant to what they need. So 80% of it, people just kind of toss out. So maybe, just maybe, 80% of what you're including isn't necessary or some, some part of that. So repair that down as much as you can and make it as concise as possible. And doing structuring it that way is very important. Also asking yourself, why write? Writing this in the first place, who am I writing it to, and what information am I trying to get out there? What are the results that I'm looking for? When you do, it also helps you to bring that together. A great tip for communication, particularly email communication, is to use bullet points in paragraphs. And that immediately there you've taken that 100% that, that of the information, you've pared it down to the 20% that's very critical and important that you're really trying to convey. People can immediately pick that out, and it, it's there. So you get a, a much better response from that. I, I understand that's not always the way that you need to communicate, but you can. That's a, a great tip for you. And by the way, folks, please reply all on your email unless you really truly need to reply to everyone. <laughs> how many of you, I bet, how many of you, have you raised your hand right now if we were all in a room together? I've got I've got a lot of people on this call. I bet I ask this question, every one of you raise your hand. How many of you wish that the reply all button didn't even exist? <laughs> I really do. Sometimes it's it's so handy and wonderful and you need it. But other times, eh, not so much. Okay, I, know, I know, hand raise, hand raise. People are typing in. <laughs> We're all there, right? We are all there. I have actually heard of companies that, that are considering removing Reply All, um, which is fascinating to me. Um, but let's just not use it unless we have to, and then we don't have to have it taken away from us. Um, that's so funny. Thank you for that. Okay, so dealing with conflict. Who likes it? Nobody. I, I don't know of anyone who says, woohoo, I'm I can't wait. I'm going into work today and I'm gonna have a fight with my boss <laughs> or my coworker. That's not something that, that most of us enjoy. But there are some strategies. It's frankly as human beings it's unavoidable. Unless you live on an island with no one else, you're 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 going to have conflict. And as I said at the beginning of the presentation, conflict can be extremely valuable, especially even in the work environment, because that's what can squeeze us a little bit and force out those creative, wonderful solutions to the problems that, that are you know, plaguing us, right? So it's not necessarily a bad thing. But think about, as we go through this, about your own strategies for dealing with or avoiding 
and we're resolving conflict. And the positive and negative on all sides. You know what? Avoiding conflict is not always a bad thing. And we'll, I'll clarify that a little, little bit as we go. But, you know, take some here about what are some strategies that might work for you? What are you doing that is really working for you? Um, conflict is normal. It's natural. It's a part of being a human being, right? And as I said, sometimes it's, it's a really positive thing. But if it's handled in a negative, inappropriate way, then we can see anger and hurt and divisiveness and even more serious problems than that. So we, you know, we want to avoid that as much as we can. But personal issues are quite often a source of conflict, and with the your personal lives or your work lives as well. And this different values, different ethics, different goals, conflicting personalities, especially. I mean, you can't pick the people that you work with, right? So you know, sometimes it's just it's just differences of just to who we are, and it creates conflict. Um, Sometimes our uh, our ideas, our choices, our actions are going to clash. They're going to be in opposition with one another. Incompatible goals with some of the people that you work with, or maybe in direct competition with somebody on your team. That's that's just a natural way to create and have to deal with conflict. People have different work styles. For those of you that you know, you live and die by the the theory, um, being early is on time, being on time is late. That's a little but we all know that person who just comes scoring in at the last second, and that can create conflict, right? So it's just different styles. And poor communication and miscommunication can be big, big causes of conflict. Let me add this in, in a, um, resolving conflict. We're going to talk about avoiding conflict first, but let me ask you this. First of all, a couple of questions. Ask yourself before you even enter into deciding about a conflict, why am I angry? Why is this a problem for me? Am I frustrated? Am I angry? am I irritated? Is this my is this just me? Is this just who I am? And maybe there's something about this person that irritates me because they remind me of somebody that I used to, you know, really not get along with when I was growing up or right? So you know, ask yourself, where is it coming from, first of all? Now, um, honestly, a lot of times we can actually avoid conflict in the first place. And and if can, that should be the goal. Sometimes that's not the most effective thing to do, but, but maybe you can. So it's so simple to respect people's differences, but gosh, we just don't always do that. You might be surprised to know how many of the conflicts that we deal with are because of differences in gender and generations and cultures and values. We live in such a, an incredibly global and diverse world. It's fabulous and exciting to me, but that can increase conflict. So we just need to learn to respect and celebrate people's differences and opinions. That doesn't mean you have to agree with them at work, right? But it does mean that you have to respect their choices and, and uh, you know, be respectful of that and, and move away from having that be a part of the conflict. Good old-fashioned golden rule, folks. Treat others as you would like to be treated, especially, most especially in the work environment. Put your personal differences aside because you're not here to make friends. It's nice if you have friends. It's nice if you get along with people, but you're here to get a job done. And when you can stay focused on the goal, that helps you to, to not focus on the personal issues that might get in the way. Your personal opinion of someone is irrelevant in the work world. You need to be responsible, professional, courteous, respectful, tolerant, even if you're frustrated because of this personal issue. Now, if someone's treating you with disrespect, that's different, right? You, you do need to address that. And actually, our next slide, we're going to talk about resolving conflict. Okay, you don't, I'm not saying you have to put up with people being disrespectful, but don't stoop to their level by retaliating with your own inappropriate behavior and comments. And my grandma always told me this, the road is always the right road. Right road, we've heard that. We've heard that, take the high road. But she tweeted a little, the high road is always the right road. It's not always the easiest road, 
usually it's mo the most difficult road, but it is always the right road. Love my grandmother. Miss her. Okay, keep your opinions to yourselves, folks, especially about private per or personal issues, I mean. should not at work be bad-mouthing anyone or putting other people down. In the workplace, people might be put off by that. I would be. If a cooker came to me and said, did you see what she did the other day? Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to think, well, what do you say about me when I'm not standing next to you with the water cooler? That's my first thought. So I'm definitely going to be turned off. I'm not going to trust that person. right? So there's really no win. There's no upside to, to having those, to, to out your opinions. If you really are frustrated with somebody and you really need to talk about that, that's what friends are for outside of work. Right? What your family is for outside of work. We don't need to uh, to be doing that at work. Um, and, and speaking of your friends and your acquaintances, you want to be careful with that as well in your relationships. Be very careful about the negative comments that you uh, that you make about people. Um, keep your distance if you can. Now understand that if if your conflict, if your source of conflict is with your spouse <laughs> or the person who sits in the cubicle next to you, that's not always going to be possible. But sometimes. That is sim the, the most simple resolution to a conflict, especially in, in you know to avoiding conflict in the workplace. Um, I, you know, oftentimes it's just, just the people that are the closest in proximity to us. Sometimes just taking a break from each other or avoid person at work whenever you possibly can is the best way to avoid the resol the uh, the conflict in the first place. Now let's about resolving conflict, okay? And we have, uh, you know, we have a couple of slides about uh, conflict resolution, and then we're going to talk a little bit about assertive communication before we go. So, and I think we've kind of talked about, you know, addressing it at an appropriate time, and that includes addressing it early before conflict gets out of control and in private. Be very full about the location in which you select to have these conversations. But also be very careful about not letting um, something get out of control. It's, it's Sometimes if it's a small thing, we don't want to bring it to somebody's attention. We don't want to seem like we're kind of being picky about things. But ask yourself, is this something that is, is truly going to take care of itself, or is this something that could potentially become something even greater? So we want on top of these issues before they get out of control. Um, speak directly with the person with whom you have the conflict. First, if you know if you work, then there might be some some other outlets for that resolution to the conflict. But try to resolve it on your own first. If it's group, you may have to address it with the whole group. Expect to be uncomfortable. It's conflict by its nature. It's not going to be fun. So understand that going into it, and that will help you actually to be prepared, okay, uh, and, and tell yourself, I know this is going to be uncomfortable. However, not addressing this could lead to circumstances that could create an additional discomfort for our entire team in the future, my future with my relationship, if you will. Um, a key point, a key point, I've already spoken of this, focus on the solution symptoms of the problem or placing blame for the problem or winning the argument and leaving a loser, focus on solving the problem. Um, you you, you want to dwell on what you perceive to be the, the other person's behaviors or issues. Just focus on what can we do to resolve this. Let's work together to find a resolution to this. Stick to the, as we said earlier, if other things come up, throw them in the parking lot, come back at it another time, but refocus on the, the goal that you've actually set before you to resolve this particular issue. It is important to use your listening skills that we've outlined already, but make sure that you're respecting the different opinions. Um, and other people are going to think differently than you. That's what they do. And in the work world, that's what we want, right? We were all the same. I don't think things would be very exciting, and we also wouldn't be too terribly creative. Um, so, you know, be willing to respect what those those different opinions are. Understand that, um, you know, they might help, help the business and not hinder it. So but before you fight over those differences, be sure that you're using those listening skills that we outlined and really are hearing what the other person is saying. Um, agree at the beginning. 
that you want back to solutions oriented. You want to solve the problem to win an argument. And I keep saying that, but <laughs> oftentimes we keep going back to that, right? You may have to compromise, folks, and you know what? You might be wrong. You might be a big part of the problem. And to swallow, but I'm here to tell you, think of the respect you gain when you can say, I was wrong, and I'm going to do things differently in the future. Thank you for helping me see that, because now we can find some resolution. That's, folks, being wrong is not weak. Be able to admit to being wrong and be open to finding something that you can do and hearing from someone else something that you can do to correct that behavior or that issue and, and, and improve self and improve your circumstances, that's a sign of strength. Honestly, that's a sign of strength and courage. Don't be afraid to be wrong. This might be the best thing that ever happened to you. Hey, that's a preaching moment. <laughs> What are your, your triggers, right? Um, what throws you? Know, know what your your switches are. Know what they are and understand that some people who know you the best know what your switches are. They know what your triggers are. So think about some ways for you to constructively control your own anger. And it could just be those deaths, right? But when you assess yourself honestly, then that will allow you to, to really – maybe not have those triggers or not have them be such a strong response for you. You know what? Sometimes it's you just got to raise your hands and retreat. This is not what we're going to resolve today, and you walk away from the issue. Appointment to come back to it, right? This in some circumstances, you've got an alligator in your swimming pool. Right. What I mean by that, picture you've got this beautiful, swimming pool in your backyard. You love it. You enjoy it. One go out to get in your swimming pool and there's an alligator. There's this alligator living in your swimming pool. And 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 go oh, with me here folks, you live in an area where there's nobody to call. There's no alligator removal company. So you're stuck with it, okay? So you're sitting there and you're like, like well, wait a minute, this is my pool. There's a, a dirt pond over there with fish and all kinds of stuff in it. You can go over there and be a lot happier. Why are you here? This is wrong. There's still in your pool. Cool. So then, because you've explained everything to the alligator about why they're wrong, why you're right, and you know you're right. There's everybody in the world would agree with you that the alligator should not be in your pool. So get in your pool. The alligator swims over, bites your toe. So you jump out of the pool. Now you're mad, right? In the pool. Now you're yelling at the alligator. Are you crazy? You, this is wrong. You're. You need to get out of my pool. Go down to the pond. Get out of here. This is my pool. You're an alligator. And you get back in, you've cried, you've whined, you've, you've used every emotional uh, uh, possible uh, tool that can to, to, to ink the alligator to get out. You get back in, the alligator comes over, and it bites your toe. Why? Why do that? Because it's an alligator, and that's its nature. And it's in your pool, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so only change your response. To what's going on. Now, I know, I know that this is not a resolution for a lot of the issues that you're facing, and I'm encouraging you to give up and walk away. What I am encouraging you to do is think about how you perhaps can shift your perspective or your response, and maybe that will help you find some resolution to those problems. And this is a, let's say, for instance, you have a relative that has a, a substance abuse issue, or um, there's somebody at work whose personality is just a rub for you and there's just you change their personality and you can't change someone's uh, behaviors there's you know there there are uh, you know substance abusive behaviors you can't do that so all you can do is change your response to that and that in and of itself might be a way for you to resolve your own conflict now a couple of questions coming in i will get to those in just a moment i don't want you to think that that i'm not seeing that i actually am and, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, so mutual conflict resolution. And as I said, we've got a couple, uh, another slide on this, and then we're going to talk about assertive communication, right? So you're working with somebody. You're using your listening skills. 
things that we outlined earlier. Identify first of all with the person, and you can keep notes on this, folks, with conversations. There's no reason why you can't, whether they're work-related or personal. Um, what is the purpose of your 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 uh, meeting, right? What is the importance of the conflict? And and note that you both have a desire to solve it, not to win, but to solve the conflict, right? Turns listening to each other. Once everything's out in the open, you repeat and summarize, ask questions for clarity, you restate so you know, you're very clear, you understand each other. You got out there, um, and, uh, you know, maybe even keep notes on what the different things, the different ideas were. Ask questions, right? And there's always be a few points on which you agree. Right, so say for instance it's a work-related thing and you're saying, okay, we agree our goal is to increase sales by 10% this year, but we're agreeing on how we need to do it. Right? Or maybe at home, you know, saying, okay, we both agree that we need to spend less so we can save more money, we just don't agree on the things that we can do without. But you've found something that you can agree on, some agreement areas. So now you want to list, literally list, write down all the possible possible solutions, even the ones that seem completely loopy and out there, because there might be a little nugget of uh, a solution in there that will work, right? So list all the possible solutions, and from both sides, review them together and put a star next to the ones that you find mutually acceptable to you that you think might actually work, and then put in place an action plan. What are the steps that you're going to make to implement these, these changes? And to implement these resolutions, what is your review process going to be? To look back and make sure that you are, in fact, doing that. But you're creating a step-by-step -step guideline to, for the uh, agreed-upon solutions and for your action plan. And don't feel like you have to solve the entire conflict in this one sitting. Just finding something on which you can agree creates a positive environment that will lend itself toward being able to find resolution in the future. Okay, now assertive communication. We have some great information on our website that can give you even more tips on this, so I'll encourage you to go on there and find that, and I believe Maria will be sending you some um, educational materials in your handouts, too, that will give you more information. But these are questions for you um, about assertive communication. It's not about being aggressive. It's not about getting your way, right? So ask yourself can you feel like you can say no to people do you always apologize when you do say no I know so many of us do that do you feel comfortable asking for help if you need it um, do you ask questions if you if you need clarity are you comfortable telling people what you're really thinking if someone's mis misbehaving do you feel like that you can or if they're behaving inappropriately do you feel like you can say something do you feel like you just always have to please people um, does conflict make you extremely uncomfortable? Do you feel like people take advantage of you? If, the, if you're answering yes to a lot of these, then you, you, you're in the right, right? You've already found some great tips that we've already shared about uh, communicating more effectively. Um, but what we're talking about with assertive communication, you have the right to act in your own best interests, which includes refusing a request. You should be able to stand up for yourself and clearly express what you want and what you need and what your ideas are. Assertive communication is about um, demonstrating your own self-respect and exercising your own rights to expect respect from others while considering their needs and their, that they deserve respect as well. Um, developing and, and expecting trust and equality in your relationships, being able to negotiate a mutually acceptable compromise, right? That's what assertive communication will do for you. It's so powerful. So what you can do is you verbalize a clear, confident message. You take all of these structures that we've just put into place, all of these strategies that we've just talked about, and you bring it all together. You plan ahead for what the conversation is going to be. You go into it. You're confident. Your body language is confident. Even if you're not fake it, because it, it'll come to you. It really will, especially with practice. You're firm, you're, but you're pleasant, right? Your tone of voice is so important. You see the issue and what you would prefer to see the outcome be. Stay very focused on what you're talking about specifically. Make sure that you're validating the other person's feelings and issues by summarizing and restating their point of view. So 
So you, all of these tips, we oh gosh, we've given you a lot of information today. And I said Maria is going to be giving you um, some additional handouts. I'm just going to take a moment. I have a few questions that have come in. And if you have some other questions, please feel free to, uh, to send those in. We'll take a few minutes. And I'll put this uh, information up here for you. It gives you a little bit more information about who we are at Work Life for you. So look back. I've got a few questions. Uh, let me back up a little bit on my chat box here. What recommendations for those work-related conflict resolution challenges that arise initially in public? Specifically, should you ask to speak with them in private versus public when the conflict is created in a public setting? Um, sending the right message to the other co-workers. You know, that, that's a really excellent question. Um, first of all, if you're looking to correct someone, um, you really do want to do that in private whenever necessary. If it, if it happens in a public setting, simply saying to the other person, you know, Bob, I think that this is something that, that we do, in fact, need to discuss. What I'd like to do, let's at a time you and I can talk about this later. You go back to your agenda, you go back to the meeting, and you immediately move forward and progress with the meeting. So you've done two things. You've taken that out of the public. You're not going to be addressing this publicly. But you have sent the message publicly that you will be addressing this. So people will understand that, right? But you, uh, I mean, really, there's very few circumstances where you, you need to address a conflict in public. Uh, very rarely does that have a positive outcome for it. But that's an excellent question. Um, how do you find res resolution with a coworker who finds fault with everything? <laughs> negative Nelly, right? We all know that negative Nelly and negative Ned. Uh, you ask them what their solution is. Now they're fine with everything. Well, you know what, Nelly? It's, it, it sounds like you're pretty frustrated with this. What do you think would be some resolution? Where do you where do you think we might be able to find some solutions? Let's talk about how we can move forward. I'll tell you what, why don't you give me three ideas that you think will help us find some resolution to this? Bring it to the next meeting, and let's let's explore those. You might have some really great ideas. So you know that's that's a really good way. Also, that might be your if if you're if this person isn't your subordinate, if this person is simply a coworker, this might be a bit of an alligator issue, um, to where you just you just shift your response to that. A lot of times, people just want to out their frustrations. They're not really looking for a solution. So using that phrase, you know, that sounds very frustrating, and leave it at that. You're not agreeing with the, what they're saying. You're just agreeing that they sound frustrated. Um, so a couple of solutions to that. Uh, how do you address a manager who checks emails, answers phone calls, and messages, oh, messing with paperwork when they called you into their office? Okay, that's difficult, very difficult, because you want to, you know, find a resolution to this. You know, or you could just simply say, but Bob, it looks like you're pretty pretty busy right now. Um, could, should an appointment for another time when you have some more time and we can actually – you know, really focus on this. This is I, I'm pretty frustrated by this issue, and you know, I really feel like we need to talk about this. You know, would would your time be better for you? The best that you can do to kind of give them the cue that you know they're they're really not giving you their undivided attention. Some people are better multitasking than others, but quite honestly, multitasking usually comes right in the back door to uh, hit us in the back of the head because it's not always the most effective way to do things. But I think that would be a good thing. And one last question before we go. How do you let a hard-to-work-with boss know that you expect respect from them without um, creating a detriment for yourself? Easy thing. Right? That's where the assertive communication comes into play. Oftentimes, people will um, push you as far as you will allow them to push you. And quite honestly, there are some aggressive personality types out there who that's their actual goal is to push you. And to find out at what point you begin to push back. I worked with someone at one point, and that was she was trying to train people that way. You know, she was trying to, to train people to turn around and say, wait a minute, you just crossed the line here, and trying to help people understand where that line was. I know that I agree necessarily with the method, um, but, but some people are actually doing that. Right? So um, you, you need to be very careful in, in how you approach that person. I would encourage you to, to get online, look at some more of our assertive communication te techniques. And really, quite honestly, when you utilize a lot of the techniques that we talked about today, people will begin to respect you more, and it will kind of come about in a natural way. It's very difficult with a boss 
to address that um, um, directly. But know what? You may actually, if it's really bad, you may actually have to say at some point, Bob, I, I obviously use your I statements. I, I don't feel respected in this position. I, I, I feel very frustrated, quite honestly. I don't, I don't feel like that my ideas and my thought processes are, are uh, being viewed as, as a, a positive part of this group. So I'd like, well, first of all, what can I do to maybe change things so that I can, uh, you know, that, that we can change our relationship a little bit so that I feel like I'm in a position where I can share some of these thoughts and ideas. Um, I would like us both to have a mutually, uh, both feel mutually respected in this relationship. That may not work for everybody, but again, looking at that assertive communication skills, I think would be a positive way to move forward with that. A couple of nice comments coming in. Thank you very much. I'm very glad that you enjoyed the presentation today. I just can't express to you what a great job we do, as our folks do at Work Life for you, the resources that are there for you. Um, for all of you folks at, at, at uh, NOAA, and I just love the work you do, by the way. My husband uh, is an air pilot. And so he's uh, he's he's all over it. <laughs> so and I know you do so much more than the weather, but um, but definitely that part of it has a big impact on my own life. So thank you so much for all the work that you do. But we really can't help you here at Work Life for you find resolution 24 hours a day, seven days a week, always confidential. Our services are always free. And um, I'm telling you, it's like a personal concierge. We are there for you. Maria, do you want to add anything before we go? I want to let everyone know you will be receiving a copy of these parts point slides by close of business day tomorrow. So on the lookout for that. Um, and also we have a, a couple of questions uh, listed down. I know we're over a couple minutes over the hour, but um, it's hard to uh, do an hour because there's so much to cover in this. But if there's just a couple I can ask, if you just have a couple of minutes, um, that would be great. Um, but thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, with this presentation, and again, you will be receiving a copy of the slides by close of business day tomorrow. Um, one question is, how do you respond when a person provides an exaggerated show of respect when you're speaking? This person is not one of my direct reports, and mannerisms are truly disrespectful. Does calling attention to it lead to conflict? I think, um, I think it would ask you, first of all, my question would be how frequently do you have to come into contact with this person? If it's, if it's relatively infrequent then, and, and you can, in fact, keep your distance, then, um, you, know, I'm, I, you know, depending upon the level of, of the irritation that it brings to you, I know that I would necessarily address it. If this is something that is ongoing and this is an issue that, uh, that you're faced with frequently, then clearly it is something that, uh, that you need to face, that you, um, you need to talk with the person about. And um, it, perhaps that person is unaware of, of how they're coming across. To you. Maybe they are. I, I don't know. But by uh, facing it head on, I think that that I think in this case that would be something that you would definitely want to do. So use the resolution, the conflict resolution techniques we shared, the communication techniques that we shared. Use your statements. You know what? I'm not. I I'm not sure if you're aware, but it in the meetings, honestly, feel disrespected by your responses. And I, I wanted to make you aware of that. Um, it just seems like they come. I feel like the presentation is coming across in a negative way, and I think it actually stifles the creativity of the group. And, and I'm concerned about our ability to to really work through this project. So, what can we do to resolve this? And I bet you, Bob, will be speechless. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what are the other questions? I just a couple of two questions. How would you see how would you address people who are very verbose? They pack a lot of issues when they're talking and they leave no pauses for them to respond. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm I'm very familiar with those people. You, just, you know what? You may just have to interrupt. Find an opportunity as much as you can to interrupt and say um especially if it's in a meeting setting. Um, you know, or if there's more than one person in the group, you know, you can say, you know, Bob, poor Bob, I'm picking on Bob today. Um, <laughs> but I think what we're going to have have to do is move on at this point. You've got some great ideas and you really brought some good ideas to the table. We're getting a little tight on time here. So what I'd like to have you do is type up the rest of your uh, thoughts into an email and send those to me and maybe we'll be able to include those in a future meeting. Sarah, what would you like to add to this? And just move on. But there are, sometimes you absolutely just have to interrupt as much as you don't want to. But the group will be believed that you did <laughs> <laughs> One last question. What do you do if someone's listening to you, but they've already made up their minds on what you're saying? 
saying? Ah, that is when you ask them to restate what you said. That's go back to the communication outline that I laid out for you earlier, and you ask them, okay, well, you know, can you just, just clarity, I just want to be sure we're both on the same sheet of music. Um, can you just, I, here's what I heard you say, and you summarize what they said, and, can, you know, can you just give me a quick summary? Because I, I, I can't, I'm not so sure we're on the same, on the same page here. Um, so that's a, that's a perfect opportunity to utilize that technique. And I'm telling you, folks, you're going to feel so powerful in a good, positive way when you use and employ these techniques that we talked about. It is so um, so wonderful to be able to walk away from a situation, especially conflict, and feel like you handled it, you handled it appropriately, and you handled it well. And people will respect you more in the future. And honestly, people will come to you more. Uh, in the future, and they'll look to you as the person, the go-to person, to find resolution and solutions to problems, and look for those creative uh, creative ideas. You'll get, you'll garner an awful lot of respect when you utilize these uh, these communication tips. Was there anything else, Maria? Nope. That's it. Um, I'm I'm just afraid that we're running over, and I know some people are having to drop off, and we'd love to address every question that's out there, but we are um, scheduled for the hour, and uh, I want to keep an eye. <laughs> So, Donna, thank you so much for taking the time with us today and going through this presentation. I want to thank everybody for joining. Um, then I do appreciate the fact, Donna, more so than I, because she's the one who did the entire presentation, that we're getting a lot of people who've enjoyed it. So, Donna, thank you very much. And, again, I'll repeat that everyone will be receiving a copy of these slides by close of business day tomorrow, so you have them as a takeaway reference. So thank you, everybody, for coming today, and uh, we hope to see you at future webinars. And, Donna, thank you. All right. Thank you, Maria, and thank you so much, everybody, for uh, for all of your uh, you know for joining us today and for all of your feedback. Have a great, great rest of the day.